This is TREP Wire Week in Review for week ending August 21st. I'm Martha Kocher with TREP, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS commercial real estate and CLO markets. I'm with Manis Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Joe McBride, Head of CRE Finance. This week, with the backdrop of schools reopening and a virtual Democratic National Convention, the economic data is a mixed bag. Initial jobless claims are up above 1 million again. Continuing claims, however, are down more than expected. Manufacturing activity slowed in July, but big retailers beat earnings expectations. And although Congress is technically on break until September, there is a GOP effort to restart negotiations with a focused relief bill. Manus, are we seeing a tale of two recoveries here, or is it simply evidence that this is happening in stages? Well, I think that the data point that was the most telling this week came out of the retailers' commentaries that came with their earnings. We saw some really terrific earnings for Q2 from Target, Walmart, uh, Kohl's was pretty good, although they sold off hard after the fact. Um, L Brands was very good. Home Depot was solid. Um, but it was really the commentary that they made that went along with their earnings that was, that was worrisome. In Walmart's case, they said that they didn't think that their sales growth, which has been through the roof for most of 2020 thus far, was sustainable. Uh, Kohl's had said that they saw a leveling off of sales at about 75% of pre-COVID levels. Their stock fell 14% on the news. Um, Home Depot was similar to Walmart, solid earnings, but concerns about whether or not it could be sustained going forward. And what it felt like to me was that the period of panic buying was ending, that Walmart and others were beneficiaries of the race to the store to make sure that you had enough Pop-Tarts to get you through the spring, fall, and summer. Um, once we got to a level of normalcy, if you could call it that, with COVID, that we were going to be in this for the long haul, but nobody was going to um, run out of food, I think you know the big retailers started to see that and said, well, we're not gonna get that same bump of people stocking up that we saw over the last three or four months. And we also have the fact that you know they released these reports in August. Uh, so they have a month and a half worth of Q3 performance data in their brains. And so they're probably already seeing a drop in sales uh, somewhat due to that 600 bucks a week going away. Right. They did mention that in some of the earnings calls, that the uncertainty of whether there would be another stimulus and if there was, how big it would be, was another area of caution for them. And whether or not that was going to lead to a spending downturn, I believe it was Walmart that said that they were already starting to see evidence of that once we got past July 31st. But Walmart had been ticking up by 10% um, you know, sales growth for the last two quarters, and that really was just um, unprecedented in recent years. So it was bound to end, the party was bound to end. Their stock didn't sell off. It was only marginally lower after their earnings came out, uh, but it was evidence that uh, for those that have really taken market share like Target and Walmart, it won't last forever. Yeah, we may have to uh, take a look at which states are taking advantage of the executive order. I think it's six or seven states so far are applying for that federal funding to pay out the additional benefits. So maybe if we could find like maybe raw stress for less or, you know, TJ Maxx or one of those uh, retailers we've never heard of is long uh, in those states and short in the others. Maybe we can go long on, on those and get a little bit of a bump in three, Q3 earnings. We did see that headline that South Dakota was not going to be applying. They did announce very publicly, their governor did, that they had handled COVID so well that their economy really hadn't hit any speed bumps and they were not in need of that supplemental insurance. So that was you know, one state's way of handling this and, and their numbers did look very good. So uh, kudos to them, I guess, for, for muddling through this as well as they did. Sticking on the retail news angle, since we've already talked about Target, Walmart, Kohl's and others, we did see some retail news come out of the CMBS market. Um, we did see that Simon is willing to give back properties 
This was not wholly unexpected. They had classified these as other, as our sister company, Commercial Real Estate Direct, had pointed out a couple months ago. So there was a chance that they would throw in the towel on these. But in parsing the various special servicing notes this month, we did see uh, formally that they were planning to give back a property in North Wales, PA, that backs the $100 million Montgomery Mall. Uh, that's part of CMBX 8. Um, the mall at Tuttle Crossing, uh, that backs a $114.8 million mall. That's in Dublin, Ohio. And then the Southridge Mall, which is part of CMBX 7. It's a $113 million loan. The mall is in Glendale, uh, Wisconsin. So that comes on the heels of CBL announcing um, first that they were giving back several properties and then re more recently that they were going to go through a prepack bankruptcy. So a lot going on there. And as my colleague Vivek mentions from time to time, it's not just limited to the US. We're also seeing things in the UK. He pointed out this week that Pizza Express was going to be closing about 20% of its casual dining locations. He wanted to make sure that I knew that. And that uh, the shirt maker, Thomas Pink, which is owned by French luxury conglomerate LVMH, is going to close down their London flagship. So there is nowhere to hide in retail, literally. I think we have to give Orest a shout out as well, because he had that Simon story uh, a few months back on uh, SiriNews.com, which, by the way, you guys should all go to SiriNews.com because we recently reskinned the whole website. Uh, so it should be easier to uh, get in there, access it, get some good 20 or 30 transactional news stories and, and some deeper stories uh, every single day. So check that out. Arrest is the Earl Monroe of the commercial real estate industry. Earl Monroe, Earl the Pearl, Earl the Pearl. used to term, torment the Knicks when he was on the Baltimore Bullets, which later became the Washington Bullets. And now it's the Washington Capitals. I don't forget what the, what the basketball team is. The Wizards. The Wizards. Yeah. In any event, rather than fight him, they traded for him. And Orest used to be more, my tormentor in that he was uh, an independent uh, publisher. And uh, every now and then he would scoop us and I would say, damn it, Orest again. <laughs> and uh, eventually we traded for him and now he's part of the family. He has been for a while uh, and we're lucky to have him. Are we uh, violating any FCC protocols on that? No, no that that's simply called a shameless plug. Oh, got it. Got it. So it's okay. <laughs> so we have a lot of remittance data for the month of July. What are the numbers telling us this month about the state of the recovery? Well, it's a lot like last month. We did see thus far uh, with about 90% of the loans reporting a nice dip once again in the overall delinquency. We think it's going to be to the level of about 40 basis points. Uh, for listeners, listeners may recall that Two months ago, we came within a couple of basis points of setting the new all-time high. Last month, we saw a dip from 10.32% to 9.6%. That was a function of a lot of loans getting forbearances, as well as some modifications and extensions. We've seen more of that this month. There's been you know, a, an uptick once again in forbearances, which is helping the number fall, and we think it'll be in the low 9% range, which is terrific. We are not seeing a lot of rebound in either retail or hotel. Those are both better, but not by a lot. On the other side of the coin, for those two hard hit parts of the market, the special servicing total for August went up once again. So delinquency a little bit better for those two, special servicing numbers a little bit higher. And one thing that we pointed out in uh, various commentaries over the last week or two is that we are now getting to the point where forbearances will start ending. And for these retailers and hoteliers that got relief in May, they are coming up to that period where they will have to start making payments in full and replenishing reserves unless they're granted extensions, extensions to their forbearances. And accordingly, uh, they may go delinquent once again in the fall. We'll see. Yeah, well, looking at my dashboard here, I see, you know, the same thing that you are. We look at a slightly different universe. I, I include some more uh, deal types. I got Conduit, SASB, Large Loan, which would include Series, CLOs, 
include defees, loans, things like that. Uh, but I see the same uh, general movements, delinquencies coming down slightly, 15 or 20 basis points in this universe so far uh, in what I'm seeing. But then uh, special servicing rates still increasing, especially in the lodging and retail sector. Uh, I think lodging, if I'm looking at things right here, yeah, from July to August, it looks like we're going from 23 and change percent to 25 and change percent. And uh, in retail, it's from 16 to 17.3, 17 and a half. So uh, it's, I wonder if it's a lot of those loans that are quote unquote curing or not, not delinquent anymore are remaining with the special servicer, right? So the ones are, that are curing are helping move that delinquency rate down, but they're staying with the special servicer and then there's new additions to special servicing. So still a lot of, uh, a lot of, what is it called? Row to hoe here. Um, so I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if we see this 30 plus days delinquent go back up at some point, you know, that's kind of the second wave, you know, Type yeah, it's idea. conditioned on two things. You know, number one is, do we get a bailout, which we know that uh, certain members of Congress have been pushing for, and, um, you know, do forbearances get extended, right? Those are the two big uh, considerations going forward. Looking at more remittance data that we saw over the last two weeks, um, for those that are not really followers of the CMBS market, every month we have something which is akin to earnings season which is really remittance season. It spans about 10 days from the 10th of the month to about the 18th of the month, 19th of the month. And um, at that point, all the loans remit, and you got a lot of data in. So we're at the tail end of that. Uh, some of the highlights or lowlights, as you might see them, we saw a lot of problems with the Houston hotel market. Several hotel owners have decided that they're gonna throw the keys back to the, uh, the lender three very big hotels in that category are ready. We've mentioned them in Tripwire, so look for those stories. We did start to see some hotels and other properties too, but mostly hotels, report H1 financials. Usually borrowers have to report financials quarterly. Their last quarter ended on 6.30, as it did for everybody else in America and worldwide. Um, it takes two or three months for the borrowers to get these reports out. So we started to see a trickling uh, of them in August. The trickling did not inspire any kind of confidence. Many of the loans saw debt service coverage ratios uh, well below 1.0x, somewhere close to zero. And when you consider that the hotels were operating normally from January through mid-March, that's really staggering that they're close to zero and not like 0.5x, 0.6x, something like that. So um, that is a trend that we'll follow up more on with Tripwire in the next couple of weeks. And we will look at that heavily in September when the numbers become more robust uh, in terms of output. Um, we do see forbearances continue to grow. We mentioned that earlier today. And we did start to see the wave of hotels and other properties start to see their values get cut. Again, this was predominantly in the hotel segment. Uh, Fortunately, in some cases, the value reduction, the new value was still above the loan balance. For example, with the case of the Mall of America, it had been valued at 2.3 billion. This, this month, a new value of 1.9 billion was released. The loan balance is 1.4 billion, so there's still room there. But we did see a handful of loans for which the new value is below the loan balance and plenty of others where the new value is you know, maybe a value that would give the loan an LTV of maybe 90 today, whereas it was 70 when the loan was made. So why are these new valuations important? Uh, as Joe really outlined uh, a week or two ago when he talked about the HOPES Act that's working its way through Congress, or I should say stalled in Congress right now, is that borrowers can take out, if this bill passes, up to 10% of the equity in their loan in terms of preferred equity, right, as a way to get through this crisis. But if these new valuations indicate that there isn't even 10% equity left in the property based on these new valuations, it may not be worth it for the hotel owner to even pursue this. 
And if that's the case, that may explain why some of these loans on hotels are seeing their borrowers toss back the keys. Yeah, so basically what that means is if for, for those young guns out there, right, if your property is worth $100 and you have a loan of $80, that means you have $20 of equity, right? And that means that you have essentially $20 of value or ownership in the property. Um, and if all of a sudden your property becomes worth, let's say $90, then you only have $10 of equity. Uh, and if it becomes worth 80, then you have zero equity and there's really no use in you continuing to own the asset unless you feel like that value is going to recover. Uh, and especially in CMBS land, CMBS loans are non-recourse, which means that the borrowers are not on the hook uh, to come out of pocket or to use any of their other assets to pay the loan down. The only kind of collateral for the loan is the actual property. So it makes it a lot easier in CMBS. It's not easy, but it's easier in CMBS land to hand over the keys to the lender as opposed to if it was a bank loan or insurance company loan where you may have personal recourse or a couple million dollars worth of recourse that you have to come out of pocket for. There are about a half dozen parts of my life where I wish I could have used that non-recourse card that, uh, you know, a couple in college, you know, maybe a couple in high school, maybe one or two in, in grammar school where... If I knew that there was something like uh, non-recourse out there, I would have uh, certainly drawn upon that, uh, that capability. I need an example. I'm not following you. Yeah. I don't I know, do like too. that, uh, you know, that 65 uh, on the test that you got the night after uh, <laughs> pledging the fraternity. Like there's one of those days I would have liked non-recourse. Just hand over the keys, teach. <laughs> That's right. Throw that one out. We don't need it anymore. And we had some stories that focused on Portland hotels where we've seen some unrest uh, in the city recently. Well, one of the stories ties back to this falling valuation. The Hotel Lucia, we saw that it was one of the hotels for which a new valuation was put out this week by the servicer. It remains above the loan balance. So that led us to look towards where the Hotel Lucia is. Uh, I've never been to Portland, so I don't know much about the city. I did share a plane ride with the Portland Trailblazers once on the Eastern Shuttle and the image of seeing a seven foot two Kevin Duckworth folding himself into a coach seat <laughs> on the shuttle was just something that was like, it was like David Blaine, right? <laughs> seeing him go into like a box full of water or something like that. But that's an aside. So I didn't really know where the Hotel Lucia was and I didn't know that it, if it was impacted by some of the protests going on, um, and it's not, it's a few blocks away, but there is a single asset deal that's backed by two Portland hotels that are adjacent to each other. Uh, one is, I believe, a Hilton, and the other is uh, Hotel Dunaway, and they really sit right between the Marco Hatfield Federal Courthouse, where there were protests um, a few weeks ago, and also Pioneer Courthouse Square. So, they're right in the teeth of it. Um, they did produce financials uh, this week that were really off from last year. And it is one to watch. Uh, the New York Times had an article that said part of the, part of the hotel was boarded up. So um, it just goes to show that not only is the COVID issue impacting hotels in other areas, but it could also be impacting places where people are avoiding uh, because of social unrest or other matters. So this is one, probably the biggest example that we saw. And those two hotels back a $240 million CMBS loan. And yeah, and you, you got to think that nobody's, I mean, obviously nobody's traveling, right? But a lot of these uh, large hotels in, you know, major cities really rely on the international traveler too. And that's just, there's no chance that uh, there's, really any international travel going in any sort of numbers right now. And that's something you don't really think, think too hard about. You think about, oh, I, you think about yourself, right? Recency bias and, you know, being a selfish human being. Uh, you know, you think about, well, I wouldn't travel today, but imagine, you know, somebody from uh, Europe or Asia, like who would have had a, you know, a tourist trip to Times Square or to LA or to somewhere else, just not happening this year. I tend to really tread carefully on these hotel stories where there's 
uh, civil unrest and protests and violence and stuff like that. Because as somebody who lived near New York in the 1970s, I know that the city as a whole got a terrible reputation. There were parts of the city that were really decaying, um, the infrastructure and so forth. But there were so many parts of the city that were still vibrant and you wouldn't know that there was unrest or there was decay and so forth. So, um, you know, we singled out this Portland story just because it was really at the heart of where the protests were. But we really try, you know, we don't throw in every Minneapolis hotel as a source of concern because we know that every city is different. And in many cases, the unrest is limited to really small segments of the city. So you do have to look at these on a case by case basis if that's your concern. And we also saw this week that Airbnb filed for an IPO. Their valuation has taken a hit by about 43% in the last year, but overall they seem to be faring better than the hotels. So a big booyah to Joe for having called this a couple of weeks ago. He was saying that you would see alternative types of companies benefits in ways, benefit in ways that we didn't expect from this COVID. And one of them was the Airbnb. So he mentioned that several podcasts ago and uh keeping with the booyah symbol jim kramer did talk about that today so uh good one for you there joe <laughs> bye 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 <laughs> and i think he did actually refer to trep data this morning if you're watching yeah walk box you know joe actually, you were probably watching sesame street with the uh the newborn in the house and you know for me it's always for sure you know, some kind of unsolved crime mystery. But I was told that uh, he gave Trip a, a booyah this morning. So, uh, yeah, we, a couple of people from, from Trep and, and outside of Trep gave us that intel that he was uh, referencing us. And that was because there were some uh, stories coming out about hotel uh, delinquencies in New York. And, you know, I think it was AH, AHLA, which is a, hotel kind of lobbying group who came out and said that they're really pushing to get some potential bailouts or stimulus going, including the HOPE Act, because if they don't, then there's going to be, you know, many thousands of jobs kind of on the hook. But all I know is that Jim Cramer uh, mentioned TREP and he's, and the letter of the day or the letters of the day was T-R-E-P-P. -P. He even spelled it out for us. So, so good on you, Jim Cramer, and we'll see you on the podcast pretty soon. You know, we got to give Jim a shout out. You know, he has a show at 6 p.m. on CNBC at night. So if you don't know about it or if you've never heard about it or you don't know who Jim Cramer is or you've never heard of Squawk Box, Yikes. check him out. He's, a, he's an interesting guy. He's been around for a long time and he's got a lot of uh, big opinions just as we do. I guarantee you there is some large pr proportion of millennials, if they are listening to this, who probably didn't know who Jim Cramer was. Right. Well, they, they do because he gets retweeted on Twitter by, you know, some fintwit people or something like that. But it's not because they're watching CNBC. I can guarantee you that. I was on a Zoom call before with some of our staff. You know, some of them, many of them are under 25. And I mentioned the band, the Bare Naked Ladies. <laughs> and I saw a couple cover their mouth and they thought I was making a racy remark. And they had to be told that this was no, this was a band in the 90s that uh, they were a real thing, that this was not me trying to uh, shock people into putting me on the unemployment line. Yeah. Keegan and I had to cover for Manus there. It's been one week since you looked at me. <laughs> <laughs> and they were one of my very first CDs that I ever bought. Oh my goodness. It was them in like Smash Mouth Astro Lounge. That's another one for you uh, 90s kids. My first vinyl was a Chicago album. <laughs> I played it until like, you know, the grooves were, you know, gone away because that's the only vinyl I had. It was either that or the soundtrack to Oklahoma from my mother's collection. Wow. You got a lot of like, uh, you know, place names in your musical collections. No Boston. I had Boston too. That was one of the, <laughs> the greatest debut albums of all time. <laughs> all right, Martha, take us away. <laughs> I'm trying. In the office sector, we had some interesting news here in the U.S. and across the pond. What were some of those stories we were looking at? Yeah, we saw, you know, a kind of a f interesting story and it's a continuing theme that we've been talking about the last few weeks, which is Amazon making big bets uh, in the office sector and in in-person work. Uh, the Wall Street Journal had a nice long article about them uh, eventually returning to their, to their offices 
Just a couple of highlights. They plan to hire 3,500 corporate workers in six major U.S. cities, including 2,000 in New York, a uh, total of 900,000 square feet of office space across the country, Dallas, Denver, Phoenix, San Diego, New York. So it's, it's funny. It's, you know, well, maybe it's not funny, but it's interesting that uh, Amazon is killing retail, but maybe the savior of office coming out of this. Another ironic move or another ironic headline this week was that um, Chevron just signed on for 300,000 square feet of space at Rice University's innovation hub. Um, so a lot of irony there, you know, the oil and gas companies have been really reducing the amount of square footage they have. So this kind of goes against the grain there. Interestingly, the innovation hub is being built in a former Sears store that's being transformed into a mixed use office building and it called the Ion in Houston. And, and so that was another green shoot, if you will, for both uh, oil and gas companies willing to spend and somebody to uh, put up something in spec. Uh, in the case of Chevron, they were the first lessee uh, to sign on for this new development side. Going back to across the pond, another shout out uh, to our friend Vivek, who we had on a couple weeks ago. Uh, some headlines there. British American Tobacco noted this week that it's looking to sell its London headquarters. The sale would ring up for them about $330 million uh, in proceeds. I don't know what that converts to pounds. Uh, it would be a sale leaseback deal if they go ahead with it. The Times of London was the first to report that, I believe. And also from BizNow, it was reported that WeWork is pulling out of a project at Devonshire Square in London. WeWork had teamed up with Nuveen two years ago to buy a 640,000 square foot building. It was to be co-owned by Nuveen and WeWork with WeWork actually managing the building and taking a 10% management fee based on the gross revenue of the building. WeWork is now walking away from that. The building does back a single asset CMBS deal that we have in our library, our European library. The Tours 2018-2 UK um, that was issued in 2018. Isn't it funny that um, WeWork was moving away from this fancy new disruptive tech idea of, you know, uh, what is it called? Gastro pubs in your, in your office and shared workspaces. They were moving towards the classic real estate investment and property management model. Right. And, and, you know, saying that this is a, this is a new and new and like cool thing that hasn't happened before. Right. But I think they just realized that we can't keep taking on giant, long-term liabilities and matching them with short-term assets, which are short-term leases. While we're talking about Europe, uh, I'll turn my attention very briefly to shout outs of the week. Uh, I wanna jump into that now because um, the Japan Post, they pinged us this week and told us they are loyal listeners, several of their people there, and they mentioned that they would love to hear more European content. So hopefully we oblige them with some of these headlines today couple of others, DL in DC, thank you for tuning in and for your questions this week. MT in California, thank you for checking in. Susie in Scarsdale, uh, Patrick K from DC, KC from Alabama, who uh, we love your research and thank you for keeping us uh, on your distribution list, it's great stuff. And uh, our very own loyal Tom F, who uh, reached out to us this week. And lastly, Donut Shorts, who is very active in the Twitter space. Uh, we find them breaking some news from time to time, even more often than from time to time, about problems in commercial real estate, uh, real estate in general, and sometimes CMBS. So uh, thank you, Donut Shorts, for reaching out to us as well. Yeah, Donut Shorts is, is part of the FinTwit world, which is a very interesting world. I've actually just recently entered the real estate Twitter world for all of the, the 
you know, negativity and co- like fake controversy and all this dross that's on social media, the real estate Twitter world is a respite from that because it's mostly people offering, you know, pretty decent advice, telling stories about, you know, how they do deals and where they came from and what to avoid and all that other stuff. So uh, a couple of really good follows. Moses Kagan is a really good follow on there. And he also, he retweets the heck out of a lot of other very good people to follow on there. So again, for all you uh, millennials and Zoomers out there, Twitter is a service, it's a news service uh, that you can go on. It's twitter.com, actually it's an app. Uh, but never mind. Just kidding. <laughs> Tenant Advisor is another one uh, that I see uh, frequently. They're they're very good too. And Michael, well, I'm going to have to come back with us next week. He's been around for a long time. But he's Michael a- MBA. Yes. Michael MBA. My man. Yes. We haven't heard from him in a while. He used no, to he, he used to retweet today. us all the time. He retweeted today a couple of them. <laughs> but he's uh, he's a reliable source too. I think he's in SoCal, and uh, he's another good follow. Let's uh, turn to the deal of the week. Cue the music, Joe. Did it, it, did it, it, deal of the week. I have two this week. The first is from New Hampshire. The Kane Company and DRA Advisors announced they acquired the Manchester Logistics Center at Harvey Road in Manchester, New Hampshire. They call it one of New England's premier distribution and logistics facilities. It is the home of True Values distribution operations, 725,000 square feet. The purchase was brokered by Chris Healy of CBRE in Manchester. Cushman and Wakefield have been retained to market over 180,000 square feet of space that is not taken by True Value. Um, That is being handled by Tom Ferrelli, Dennis Dankos, Sean Duffy, Sue Ann Johnson and Kevin Hanna of Cushman and Wakefield. So that is deal number one. Deal number two, we are short on details. Uh, Hopefully we'll give you more next week, but it was forwarded forwarded to us by a listener who had no stake in the deal, but he thought that the item was interesting. It was uh, Providence Healthcare had sold a Parcel, a parcel of space in downtown Vancouver to developer Concord Pacific for $1 billion. Concord has not mentioned yet, as far as I can tell, what they plan to do with the space. Um, Providence Healthcare will be using the money to operate a new hospital nearby. But as the listener mentioned to us, the listener from Toronto, uh, it's a real sign of faith in the commercial real estate market for somebody to pay a billion dollars for what is effectively land. So whether that land turns into office space, um, residential housing, apartments, uh, retail, or something else remains to be seen, but uh, a terrific um, point out to us of a deal which is a sign of the market rebounding. Early this week, we published a blog that was a follow-up to analysis that looked at variances in net operating incomes, comparing underwritten and actuals. Those who listened to our podcast last week got a preview of that. What are the updates to that story, Joe? Yeah, so we, you know, we talked about it last week. It all kind of stemmed from a Wall Street Journal article um, talking about a research report, a research paper that came out of UT Austin. And the research paper looked at uh, underwriting of commercial mortgage-backed securities loan, commercial real estate loans, uh, and in particular, net operating income. So basically, when you're originating a new loan, you're, when you underwrite it, you're, you're coming up with an estimate of how the property is going to perform in terms of its kind of income statement. So very simply put, it's you know, rental revenues minus operating expenses equals net operating income. And that NOI is the kind of most important number uh, when bond investors, ratings agencies, uh, and just pure commercial real estate investors are looking at these properties and loans. And their thesis uh, was that there was some inflation, quote unquote, of the underwritten NOI numbers. And uh, the story kind of put those, you know, COVID and the underwriting in the same bag. which was an interesting choice. But 
Anyway, we wanted to uh, follow up and really take a look at the numbers ourselves. And we wanted to get something out quickly because we had a lot of uh, clients asking us about this. And upon our initial very quick review of the data, we found that if you looked at uh, underwritten net operating income numbers compared with 2019 uh, actual performance NOI numbers, that the ratio of the two was right on about 100%, right? And maybe it was 100.4% or it was 99.6%, depending on how you sliced and diced the data, if you included just conduit deals or SASB deals or, or one or the other. Now, we've been continuing to work through this data and it's something that we really, we don't want to mess with. We want to, we want to make sure we get right. So there's a lot of normalization that has to happen. You know, we have to um, put all of the different originator shelves together and kind of normalize those names and everything else. But I'll just give you a little snippet of, of what we're finding so far. If you break things down by property type, it's actually uh, a couple of the non-major property types have done the best. So looking down the list here, looking at basically from 2013 to 2019 originated loans, comparing their underwritten NOI to their best NOI, which would be their maximum NOI over those uh, six years. Self-storage was at 122% of underwritten NOI. Manu or I should say mobile homes, which we used to call manufactured housing, 120%. Lodging, well, this is pre-COVID. Lodging, 109%. Industrial, 108. Multifamily, 107. Retail, 103. Office, right on 100%. And then mixed use healthcare and co-op housing, which doesn't really count. We can talk about that if we want. It's kind of inside baseball stuff. But mixed use and healthcare were the ones that were below 100%. So, you know, really kind of promising numbers, in my opinion, uh, looking at this. And we're going to continue to kind of dive deeper and do some distribution analysis and things like that to make sure that we're, we're looking at this correctly. Yeah, two points with that. Number one is that what Joe is saying now is slightly different than the blog, as, as he mentioned. In the blog, we only looked at 2019 numbers versus underwritten, and that's when they were flush on each other. His group now for the last week has been looking at max numbers from the 2013 to 19, and that's why they seem even better. It's something we thought might happen last week, and, and sure enough, it, it did happen as we expected. Um, something to bear in mind, and, and he will be rolling out um, a lot of stuff over the next couple of days that reveals more about that. But the second point is that we've been having conversations with many of the banks that potentially were impacted by this study, either reputationally um, by being kind of cast into this net of negativity or those that were concerned that um, perhaps the numbers did reveal kind of a hole in their processes. Fortunately, we haven't seen anybody uh, at this point that needs to dust off their resume and give up on commercial real estate and go join the circus or anything. There's, there's nobody out there in that category. Um, but with every bank we speak to, everybody looks at these things differently. Everybody has a different angle, whether it, it, it's regard to um, how do you deal with loans that are footnoted for which there are rent abatements? Should we be also looking at the minimums? Um, how should we compare loans that were co-underwritten by multiple banks, you know, how has conduit compared to SASB, right? Because in the banks, those are two different groups often making these loans. So a lot of nuance there. We've had some great conversations. I really feel like the banks are taking this seriously as they should. Um, this is not something that should be swept under the rug, but the early returns are, I would say favorable to the industry. And we're optimistic that when all is said and done, uh, we can tell a happy story. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we are looking at kind of the life of the property or the life of the loan performance, because that's uh, what the underwriting is supposed to capture. Basically, right? The underwriting is supposed to capture how this property on average is going to perform over the life of the five, seven, 10 year loan. So that first year out of underwriting might not be uh, right on the money uh, because and in a lot of cases, there's actually footnotes and explanations and actually in pretty much every case uh, of any sort of deep drop, usually it's because we talked about it last week, right? There's a rent concession for six months. 
uh, where, which is reserved for, or there's tenant improvement that uh, needs to be done to get this new tenant in place. And there's reserves kind of put aside for that. You know, there are, are obviously going to be uh, the rare occasions where, uh, you know, you underwrite to a million dollars of NOI and then the factory down the street shuts down or, you know, JP Morgan, who has 10,000 employees in the area moves their headquarters or, you know, whatever it may be, those types of kind of unforeseeable things. We talked about being a reasonable human being last week, Manis, and you asked me if you were one. Jury's still out on that. But if a reasonable kind of, you know, CRE expert underwriter, you know, can, cannot foresee something, I, I wouldn't hold it against them when, you know, acts of God or force majeures or, uh, you know, huge kind of demographic shifts occur that you didn't really see coming. Let's make no mistake that if you compare this to like high school for me or for college, right? 99 out of every 100 days was great. I was hanging out with my buddies. I was playing basketball at lunchtime. There were laughs everywhere. It was wonderful. But every 100th day, there was that cringy moment where, you know, <laughs> You just wish you had it back. And that this that's going to be recourse true. thing again? No, this is going to be true. Of, <laughs> every one of these lenders will have, you know, one out of a hundred where they say, ah, I wish I had that one back. That, yeah, that was, that was a guy I probably shouldn't have dealt with. Or that was a decision I made that, you know, it was a cuspy loan and we went ahead and did it and it didn't turn out well. Um, there's no getting around that. And, and people that look deeply into the details will see these examples. Um, but I would say that they're going to be, the ex exceptions by far. And everybody will have their couple of ones, those cringy moments, just like I had in high school. I think you, I could see your faces on Zoom and you're all saying, you must have had a cringy moment every four days. But it's not true. <laughs> I had a great high school, high school life. But <laughs> that's what it'll be. There'll, there will be some that people can point to and say, this alone never should have been made. And, and those people will be right. But it won't happen often. And uh, it'll be the exception in my estimation at this point in the process. Yeah, makes sense. In CMBS, loan modifications are one strategy for borrowers that are looking for relief, and loan bifurcation is a potential approach. Give us a quick overview of that and how it works, Manis. Well, last week we talked about appraisal reductions to probably the dismay of many people who, <laughs> you know, went back to watching uh, C-SPAN instead of listening to us at that point. You know, we, we lost a lot of people. It's like the blowout in the Super Bowl. This might be of similar ilk, so um, we apologize for those that are not is, so into the weeds. This is slightly sexier than appraisal reduction amounts. <laughs> so what happens, and this was very, this happened very frequently in the great financial crisis, is suppose you had a property that was worth $150 million and you had a $100 million loan on it, uh, a retail property, an office, a hotel, and so forth. Something happened, tenants left, competition came up, the value was sliced, as we saw with appraisal reductions, and the new value was, for argument's sake, let's say $60 million. So the loan was $40 million underwater. It was $40 million of negative equity. Normally, that's the kind of situation where the borrower sends back the keys and says, I'm out. But many times what would happen is the servicer the special servicer and the owner would work together to come up with a structure that worked. This would work when the borrower really wanted to keep the property. They were willing to inject some cash into the property and they were willing to try to work hard to rehabilitate it. And what would happen in this circumstance is the special servicer would bifurcate the loan, meaning they would create a $60 million A note which would be the value of the property today. They would create a $40 million hope note, which is what the slang term was for. It was also called a B note, that if their property recovered its value, the special service or the CMBS trust would not lose the money if this thing turned out great. And in between those two would be a small tranche that was devoted to the property owner that would allow them to recover their equity that they put back into it and gain some juice from the recovery of the property value. 
So it was a special servicer's way of keeping the existing owner motivated and in the game. And we haven't seen any of these yet, but it would not surprise us if this was the outcome for some, if not many, of the hotel and retail loans that are currently on the rocks. That is something we could see happen again in 2020 and 2021. And if you're in this business and you wanna see kind of how these work, we can show you some examples from historical times, 2008, 2009, how these worked. If you're somebody that needs to become familiar with this modification technique, ping us by all means uh, by email. One that I remember always seeing on the list was the Schron portfolio. Remember that one? I remember in 2012, when I was a lowly analyst writing a lot of credit stories about these loans uh, getting resolved, right? They'd gotten this bifurcation, this split modification uh, in 2009 or 10, and then by 12 or 13, they had gotten to the point where they were selling the property or refinancing. And I mean, honestly, in most cases, the B note or the hope note was going to get washed out a hundred percent. Um, but there were some times where there was recovery of the hope note. But I think that the idea is that the special servicer believes that getting a recovery of that $60 million a note is going to be a better outcome. If they go through this process, than if they were to just foreclose on the property that day, and try and sell it, right? Right, we see many indications or many experiences where the A note was paid back in full and the B note was, was lost. I'm not sure this is true. This may not be real news, but I do think that the term was coined by Trish Hall um, back in 2008. She's now with AIG, but she is one of the real founding mothers, if that's a term, of the CMBS market. She really did incredible amounts of heavy lifting early in the industry's uh, cycle to help CREFC, which was then CMSA, build its reporting standards and so forth. She's really the encyclopedia on why decisions were made and a big reason for why the industry is what it is today. So as far as I recall, she was the one who coined the slang term hope note, but uh, perhaps it was somebody else, but those were fond memories for me of, of those times building the industry. Well, the difference uh, between now and then, I think, is that back then it was a, it was a financial crisis and it was a, a great recession and all, um, but there was, a, there was this belief that you know, things were going to come back eventually, right? including the consumer buying at brick and mortar retail like that. We take for granted that this concept of brick and mortar, you know, going down the tubes has always has been around for a long time, but it's really only the last five years where it's really accelerated. So when they were doing these AB note splits, there was a, a belief that, you know, the value would recover enough to at least get back the A note. But now I don't know if that's going to be true for at least for, you know, some of the worst retail properties. I think for lodging, I hope and believe that, you know, Travel will come back, business travel will come back, tourism will come back, you know, when this kind of uh, recedes, maybe it won't come back to 100% of what it was, uh, you know, for a, for a while. But there might be that, that question of, will I even see any value recovery in a mall, per, let's say, right? And turning to CLOs again, we had an interesting story this week that looked at how two private operators might see things based on the outcome of the presidential election this year. What did that story look like? Well, it's interesting. You know, we've only been in the CLO reporting business for about 18 months, and many on this podcast know us as CRE and CMBS experts, uh, but we do cover the CLO market. And, and really what we're looking for are places, as we do in CMBS, where investors can get tripped up, whether that's um, CLO managers or leverage loan holders and buyers and so forth. And an interesting one came in this week. It was about the firm's core civic and the GEO group. They are private uh, prison operators. Um, the stories that were released this week noted that they were heavily um, donating to Republican causes and once we scratch beneath the surface, we, it, revealed, it was revealed that they get $1.3 billion of their revenue, or at least they did last year, from contracts with the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, 
Um, that represents about 30% of their revenues. As we know, uh, many Democratic contenders in the primaries and, and now the party itself, uh, many in the party itself have been calling for the abolishment of ICE. So certainly if that were to take place, those two firms could be impacted very heavily. We were noting that um, the firm's leverage loans, which are plentiful and sizable, um, you know, trade in um, the 90s, you know, not too far away from par. And this could be a downsize side risk for leverage loan buyers or um, for CLO managers, which is not really all that well understood. Uh, for GEO, the GEO group, they have a nearly $800 million loan that spreads at LIBOR plus 200. It's due in 2024. Core Civic has a $250 million loan, uh, which is due also in 2024. Um, it's a LIBOR plus 450. The first one, the GEO position, is held by about 11% of all CLOs. So it's quite sizable. 130 CLO vehicles hold that. So just something to watch as the election comes by. And as we noted in our, in our research, probably more downside risk to those credits right now than upside potential. It always boggles my mind, uh, you know, learning more and more about the, you know, the corporate CLO market and how you know, coming from the world of growing up in this CMBS space where the, there's one loan on one property generally, and it's in one CMBS deal and it stays in that deal until it gets paid off or it takes a loss and gets paid off, right? So having this concept of one loan split across 250 different structures and any one of those structures can trade in or out of the loan pretty much at any time, it's kind of always wild to have that conversation with our CLO experts at TREP. And then when they're talking to us, they have the same kind of mismatch in their minds because they're so used to that kind of liquid pool trading in and out, you know, prices moving up and down. You don't necessarily care that much about any one particular loan in a pool because they're, they're very small pieces and you could always trade out of them. So it's kind of a whole new thought process for us. But I also think we're, we're probably bringing a loan level type of analysis to the market that's probably not been out there before, or at least not out there the way that kind of we do it. So uh, it'll be, it'll be uh, useful to see, you know, how many people are, are interested in this type of stuff. Well, it's interesting with the geo loan that, you know, it's spread is so tight. It's only 200 basis points over LIBOR. And really where the managers make their money is with, you know, the nice fat spreading leverage loans, which this is not one of them. So in that particular case, you're getting not a lot of juice and what would appear to be a lot of downside risk. So it will be interesting as we see the remittances come in over the next two or three months, um, if this becomes a smaller portion uh, of the CLO universe, if more and more, more and more managers look to move this uh, from their from their bucket list or their. It's a good idea. Trade. We should we should think about you know. There's probably ten or fifteen other kind of themes, like election-based themes within the CLO universe, other different industry types and stuff like that, that, that would be affected by either a change or a non-change in November. But we'll stick to sports today. So believe it or not, Labor Day is two weeks away. And if you're making plans for a trip and you decide to stay at an Airbnb, you'll need to comply with their worldwide ban on house parties. So in the spirit of keeping it small, you've got some ideas? Well, it ties back to, for me, the whole college thing, right? That's where you're seeing so many of these parties taking place and you're seeing kids not really abiding by the rules or maybe the rules weren't be, being written well. Um, we did see UNC this week you know, only two or three days after the students arrived, they basically kicked them back off campus uh, and they're, they're going virtual uh, in, in their entirety. Michigan State did the same thing. Uh, Notre Dame, I believe, took a two week pause out of that. And, and that is just, I, I don't know who to blame here. I don't know if it's bad, bad planning on the part of the college administrations or if it's a low threshold of tolerance for what's going on 
or if the kids are really nuts. Um, but I, I was following a story today that my 18 year old was telling me, and that was that Purdue had either suspended or expelled seven students today for not complying with social distancing rules, which seemed like an extraordinarily harsh penalty for me. I'm not sure if Mitch Daniels, the former Indiana governor, is still the president there, but you know, we should try to get him on the podcast because you know, it just seems extreme, an expulsion for something like that. I mean, can't you just make them listen to the TREP podcast and do a report like kids did years ago, <laughs> you know, on the impact of appraisal reductions on the price of butter? I don't know. Like, isn't that uh, pain enough? Well, here's the thing that, that I don't really seem to understand. All because, like, you, North Carolina or whatever, any other uh, school brings all the kids to campus and then a few get sick and then they say, stop coming to class. You think they're going to stop going to parties? You think they're going to stop, like, having house, like, if anything, it's going to be like more parties because I don't have to wake up and go to class. I can just roll over and open my laptop and put on a fake background. Well, I have a different thought. I just came from a school where my son had uh, a test before he went there. They have on-site testing. I'd say most of the kids were wearing masks. Most of the parents dropping off their kids were wearing masks. So yeah, that's all good. Like everyone should be doing that. I'm not saying I gotta say I was impressed. And even if they have to pivot to a full online model, I think they've got the right approach. I long for the days when all you worried about was whether or not your kid was wearing shower shoes. You didn't want to bring it home foot fungus. But like, wouldn't that be great if that was your biggest concern? Don't forget your flip-flops. All the days. Well, with that, we'll close. Thanks to our producer, Keegan St. Anjme, who has his work cut out for him today. Join us next week as we look at what's happened during the week and how it's impacting you. If you have a question, you know the drill. Send us an email at podcast at trep.com and we'll probably give you a shout out. For more info, visit trep.com and subscribe to the Trepwire podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you for listening and stay well. All right. <laughs>